Today on Blue 58, the Packers could probably use some help at cornerback, but the kind of help they need will depend a lot on their internal opinion of the position. Where does that leave this year's draft class? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, and I'm very happy to be with you here for another episode. We're going to talk corners today, but first I want to take a question from listener Eric Statz. He dropped this in our Discord server recently. He writes, last year I posed a question about the Packers' success in drafting two players at the same position in the first few rounds of the draft. Given we have five picks in the top 100, that seems even more of a possibility this year. What do you think the most likely position candidate is for that this year? An interesting uh, proposition for the question, good framing of the question, too. This says something the Packers have done with some success, and maybe not quite so much success over the past two years. Dating back to 2017, they've tried this a few different times. 2017, they tried the three running back draft. They got, uh, in order, Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones, and then Devontae Mays. That's something you, you may have forgotten. But for the first few years of their career, Jamal Williams is actually a higher-paid running back than than Aaron Jones, even though Jones was clearly the more important back for the Packers, and I think overall the better back, but because he was drafted higher, he had a, he had a more expensive contract there. Uh, but they ended up with two out of three there working out pretty well. The next year they tried drafting three receivers, uh, Jamon Moore, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and Equinemia St. Brown. Not quite the same results there. But more recently, as Eric points out here, the Packers have tried to double dip at a couple positions. And I think the ideal double dip on a position is taking one early and then one relatively late. Because then you've got kind of your premium option and then your backup option. You've got Christian Watson and then Romeo Dobbs. You've got Jaden Reed and then Dontavian Wicks. And then kind of Luke Musgrave and Tucker Kraft, an early guy and then a later guy. You're just injecting more resources without spending big twice, uh, but they could go with the same position early. You could also throw out a couple examples of things, again, not working so well. Even if you do spend two picks early, how about the 2015 draft class when the Packers picked Marius Randall uh, and Quentin Rollins in in rounds one and two? Or was Rollins a third round pick? I I don't remember exactly. It doesn't really matter because neither of those guys really worked out regardless of where you picked them. But if the Packers were to do something like that this year, I think the positions you'd want to look at are um, as follows. The first is offensive line. I think that's the most obvious need, and you have needs at a couple different positions. On top of that, you can never really go wrong adding depth on the offensive line. And the Packers have prioritized this over the past few years, really developing guys, keeping them on the practice squad for a long run, really giving them a chance to to work into their system and, and figure out what they want to do with these guys. You look at their long-term time investment in guys like uh, Luke Tenuta, who I know has been injured, but the Packers seem to really like him and they want to keep him around. Uh, and Caleb Jones, who's been on the Packers roster here for essentially two years with no real playing time whatsoever. Rasheed Walker is kind of in that boat as well. Yash Nyman before all of those guys, but they've dumped a lot of time into developing that depth, and it's it's served them pretty well. Now they're going to have to add in a little bit more talent here because I think you've got a pretty apparent need at right guard. Even if you think Sean Ryan is the future, there's very little depth behind him. I don't think Royce Newman is is going to last through camp this year. Uh, just because of what he costs to keep around and, and what the Packers would stand to gain, you know, just with going in a different direction in terms of in-season spending there. They could use depth at, at both tackle spots with David Bakhtiari obviously being gone and Yash Nyman uh, no longer being around. It's pretty thin behind Rashid Walker and uh, and Zach Tom. Uh, but you could just use depth, and you could even throw in needing a little bit of competition at center there too or just looking ahead. Uh, the reality is that that Josh Myers is probably not a long term like extension candidate for the Packers, so they're probably going to need a center sooner than later anyway. So you're probably looking to add a little bit a bit of competition there if you can. I think safety is another situation where the Packers might want to double dip, just because you need different kinds of safeties uh, to make this scheme run. Ideally, ha- Jeff Halfley has said. Uh, that you want two different kinds of guys, one your deep safety and one guy who go, who can play near the line of scrimmage. So you're either going to need another guy who can do that um, kind of versatile role that Xavier McKinney um, can do, where he can play deep, where he can play close to the line, where he can play in the slot if you need him to. Or you need a guy that's going to be so good at one of those two things that it's going to for- force McKinney to one of those other roles almost permanently. I don't think that is the more likely outcome. But 
maybe you're looking for a guy who's a little bit stronger, closer to the line than McKinney is and let him play deep more, or a guy who's exceptionally good playing deep so McKinney plays at or around the line of the sc- line of scrimmage a little bit more. Whichever way you want to go there, you've got some options. So depending on how the draft breaks, the Packers may just add in a couple different safety options because in addition to filling those roles, you probably just need some depth at the position too because right now it's Xavier McKinney and uh, Anthony Johnson, and really that's about it at safety. Benny Sapp too, I suppose. Um, but it's it's really just they they need some depth there. So um, they they could use a couple different options at safety. And then if you really want to, to throw another one in there, linebacker could be an option if the Packers are really looking to add talent. I'm skeptical, again, of the idea of drafting a premium linebacker. Uh, but if they want to do something like they did, say, with running back in 2017, as we mentioned, this may be a year where you take a couple swings on day two or three and just see what you get in terms of adding talent. Because right now they have Quay Walker, Isaiah McDuffie in a contract year, Eric Wilson, and Christian Welch, or Christian Welch, depending on how, Christian, I think it's Christian um, Welch, depending on how you want to you know, look at that position that's that's really not a lot of long-term options there. Uh, so they're going to need talent one way or another, and just adding a couple bodies there is going to smooth out the transition between where the, the linebacker position is now and where they'd probably like it to be in year two or year three of the Jeff Halfley era in Green Bay. So double dipping, a uh, good idea if you can do it. Uh, get somebody early, get somebody late. Uh, and then as far as the Packers needs this year, I would say offensive line safety and linebacker. Cornerbacks in this year's draft. Overall seems like a pretty good class, but it is a tough one to evaluate for a couple of reasons. The first is there are a lot of guys with just no testing data or not enough testing data to to put together a relative athletic score. Uh, There is also a a decent number of guys with just kind of borderline relative athletic score numbers. There's also the inherent problem with defensive back scouting. And I feel like I say this about almost every position, but cornerbacks are uniquely difficult to scout. Every position has its unique challenges when it comes to evaluating them, either, you know, doing the stuff that we do, trying to evaluate basically by numbers and and research, or by just hardcore tape grinding. Every, Every position has its its own challenges when it comes to getting your arms around these prospects. But I think that defensive back stuff in general and cornerbacks in particular present some very difficult issues. For one, usage varies a lot. Uh, You can have different usage in terms of scheme. You can just have different responsibilities with the, the kind of cornerback that you are. And even just where you stand on the field has a big effect on who you are as a player and what you do as a player. Just as a very broad example here, uh, the wider hash marks in college play a huge role in how cornerbacks can be used. If you end up on one of the hash marks, you have one side of the field that is dramatically smaller than the other side of the field to a much greater extent than you see in the NFL. As a result, you really have what's called the the field corners, the guys that are, are essentially playing a huge chunk of the field. And then you have the, the boundary corners that are get, able to use the sideline in a much greater way than the field corners are. So you have the field side and the boundary side. That really isn't a thing in the NFL in the same way. There really isn't a boundary corner in the same way as the NFL. And you see that uh, show up schematically a lot with how offenses are choosing to attack defenses these days. What do you see a lot in the NFL right now? Condensed formations. A lot of guys lining up close to the middle of the field and going every which way from there. If you get all your offensive players near the center of the field, that means all the defensive players are going to the center of the field too, which if you're looking at cornerbacks means that almost everybody has to operate like a kind of slot corner where you're having you know, two-way releases all the time for your, your receivers. They could go left, they could go right, they could go down the field. It's very hard for guys to use the sideline. And I think that sort of change in the NFL's meta game has really hurt guys like Eric Stokes, for instance, whose entire existence is predicated on, you know, having great long speed forward and back, but not having to go side to side all that much. That was a, a weakness of his in college. You see it in his testing data. And you see it in the struggles that he's had in the NFL. Side to side is not a great fit for Eric Stokes, but side to side movement is what you really need from corners in the NFL these days because of how offenses are playing. 
The other problem is that usage doesn't necessarily ne- doesn't necessarily show up in in stats. That seems obvious, but it it bears a little bit of I think further explanation because stats always aren't always indicative of a guy's performance. I think in college they usually are, but not always. We lean pretty heavily on plays on the ball, ball hawks in in our cornerback analysis every year, even at the NFL level. It's something that we talk about with guys like Jair Alexander, year in and year out, plays on the ball. It it is important. It is an objectively important thing to be able to do. Ball skills are important. Making plays on the football is important. Um, Dating back to grade school football when I played. Uh, Good old Coach Washington holding up the football on the first day of practice saying, this is what the game is all about. If you bring me this on the sideline, metaphorically speaking, he didn't want you to take the ball off the field. But if you bring me this, I'm never going to take you off the field. If you lose this, you're never getting on the field. It, it's all about making plays on the ball. If you can do that consistently, you are a valuable player. However, sometimes you can be so good that you don't have opportunities to make plays on the ball because nobody throws the ball at you as a cornerback. Here's kind of a mind-blowing statistical example. If you are an NFL fan of a certain age, you may remember Oakland Raiders quarterback Nandi Asamoa. He was a an outstanding cornerback. Uh, from 2008 to 2010, he was two times a first-team All-Pro. He was All-Pro second team one time, made three po- Pro Bowls in that span. One of the best corners in the league, and nobody ever threw the ball at him. It's wild to think about. But over that three-year span, he had two total interceptions and 18 passes defense. That, that would be 20 total ball hawks in our numbers here. Part of that was because of how bad the rest of the Raiders' defense was, but part of it was because, because of just how good Asamoah was at doing the things that he needed and wanted to do on the football field. He shut down half a field, and nobody threw the ball at him. Now, of course, that may not always be indicative of your overall talent level. Sometimes they just don't have to throw at you. Sometimes you're so far out of position that you're just not going to make plays on the ball, and maybe you just don't have good ball skills. But it's worth remembering that making plays on the ball is important, even if it's not your entire you know skill set as a corner. So how do we evaluate corners then? What do we use here at Blue 58 to, to kind of sort through the the wheat and the chaff of the position. First and foremost, athleticism is at a premium at cornerback, in my opinion. We don't even bother spending much time on people with a relative athletic score under eight. If if there is an ultimate athleticism position in the NFL, I think it's cornerback because you have to be so reactive, you have to be so quick, you have to have a baseline level of speed to even be competent. And like at running back, you can be a good enough running back if you run a mid four five to four six forty. There is nobody really good enough at corner to play away something like a 4-6, 40-yard dash. It really just doesn't happen. And if somebody runs a 40-yard dash and they end up being a good player in the NFL, it's usually because they, they bombed their 40. Nobody who is consistently slow is going to succeed at corner in the NFL. And the same goes for your your lateral agility, your three-cone dr- drill and your, your short shuttle. You just can't get by without premium athleticism or borderline premium athleticism in some way at the NFL. You have to be physically exceptional in some way. We also look at uh, pro football focus's coverage grade. Uh, We will look for a coverage grade of 70 or more in your final college season. That is a fairly low bar. We're more looking to eliminate anybody who had a really bad final season. We only use the final season because, for one, it would be time intensive to evaluate over the whole course of somebody's career. You also have to weigh numbers different ways if you're using um, the overall course of their career. I figure by just using their last year in college football, if they played a decent amount of time, if they just played like two games or something, we'll we'll take some other things into consideration. But looking just at at that final season, I think that should represent a player at the peak of his powers and really what we're going to be looking at the most intensely as we try to figure out what he's going to be as a, a pro football player. Then we want 25 or more career ball hawks. If you are a three-year starter or even a two-year starter, which is a good bet for elite college defensive backs, this should be pretty much a walk in the park. And that seems to be true for the sample of guys that we looked at this year. Four guys in our sample had 30 or more. And I realize that's a little bit different these past couple of years because of guys having longer careers in college due to the, the pandemic back in 2019. I still feel pretty comfortable with that 25 number because it does weed a couple of guys out for good and bad reasons. But um, it seems like a pretty, pretty safe number to to look at here. So 
uh, assume that we're talking about eight or higher relative athletic scores in all of these guys that we evaluate. So guys that didn't have testing data, unfortunately, didn't end up uh, in our consideration here. So we may go back at some point and add in further numbers from guys who have had pro days and stuff like that. I think we have a pretty good number here, though. Uh, but tier one is going to be guys that had a 70 plus coverage grade and 25 or more ball hawks. Tier two is just the 70 plus coverage grade. I figure the grade is more stable than the, the counting stats. And then tier three is uh, just the 25 or more ball hawks. In terms of this year's sample, we had 31 cornerbacks in the top 50 at the time of our sample, which is mid-March, so about three weeks ago at this point. Uh, that is from the uh, consensus mock draft database, or the, the mock draft database's consensus big board. 24 of those 31 cornerbacks had enough testing data to produce a relative athletic score. Only 10 of those 24 broke eight. So that's a pretty small number for us to talk about, but I think that is a, a fairly manageable figure and a couple of borderline guys that we'll mention. I also want to mention that we're going to try to talk about slot corners in their own episode. So if there's a guy that we don't mention that you've seen that broke the, the eight threshold on relative athletic score, uh, they're probably coming. We're going to do cornerbacks and or slot corners and safeties together because, again, due to testing data, we've got a pretty small sample there. It could just be a weak class for safety and slots. Take that for whatever it's worth. It's one guy's opinion. In terms of what the Packers need here, the, what I hinted to in the opening here is that it's going to depend pretty heavily on what they think about their cornerbacks internally. So Jair Alexander is probably the guy you, you feel best about for obvious reasons. Beyond that, you've got Corey Ballantyne uh, and Carrington Valentine and Eric Stokes. I think the the book on Ballantyne is that he's a, a high effort guy who's going to give you everything he's got. Unfortunately, sometimes what he's got for you just doesn't measure up. And I'm not really sure how he fits in Jeff Halfley's system. So a, a little bit of some reservations there. Then you've got Carrington Valentine's, who I think is a, a great, great fit for what Jeff Halfley wants to do. He's aggressive, wants to get up in people's faces, wants to play press man. That seems to fit pretty closely with what Jeff Halfley has talked about wanting to do at cornerback. So I think he's a good fit there. The wild card then is Eric Stokes. The, what the Packers think of Eric Stokes going into this, his, what is it now, his fourth season here in the NFL? Uh is going to to make or break, I think, what they do at cornerback in this year's draft. And it probably should lead to them taking a cornerback at some point. Because I think Stokes has shown that he can be good in, in certain situations. But those situations where he gets to play an outside corner and role in a very specific sort of way are dwindling in the NFL. So fewer opportunities to do what he's really good at. And he still has some pretty big injury questions here. He had the big injury in his second year, and in his third year was delayed in part by recovery from that injury and then a, a series of new injuries uh, over the course of the 2023 season. I think they should be looking at, at getting just more depth here, if only because Eric Stokes is more of an idea than an actual player at this point. And they should probably just be giving Jeff Halfley more to work with at corner at this point. So who are we talking about here? Let's talk about the actual candidates. First off the board is 12th overall, um, I guess, on the, the, the consensus mock draft big board, uh, Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo. Six feet tall, 195 pounds, a tier one prospect for us. 91.6 coverage grade his final year with the Rockets. 53 career ball hawks, 45 passes defensed in his career. I know that Toledo is not exactly a hotbed of football talent, but if you if you want to look for somebody who meets the, the very definition of what we've looked at in the past for, for smaller school players uh, dominating their competition, I think this is what the statistical profile looks like. Immaculate coverage grade, making plays on the ball, spectacular athlete. This, this is what a dominant small school player, I think, looks like just from a profile perspective. Athletically, this guy has it all. He does everything that you need him to do. Again, a remarkable athlete uh, in the, the mid-nines on his relative athletic court, does everything you need him to do on the football field. The knock on Mitchell is that Toledo did not necessarily ask him to do all that much. They just asked him to go out there and be a dominant athlete. They didn't ask him to press all that much, and scouting reports knock that for him. Um, I think he probably could do it if you needed him to, 
Uh, but uh, concern over whether or not he'll be able to early on, I think, is justified just from the fact that they, they didn't necessarily have him doing it all that much. And it wasn't great when they did have him do it. But that, that seems to be a, a learned skill or at least a learnable skill. Fun fact about Mitchell, he is the first Toledo Rocket ever to be named to all five major All-America teams in his career. The AP, the AFCA, the FWAA, the Sporting News, and the Walter Camp All-American teams all recognized Mitchell in 2022 or 2023. And I am certainly not an expert on Toledo football, but I think that would probably give him a legitimate claim as being the best player in Toledo Rockets history if he's the only person to ever do that. That's a pretty strong argument in your favor. He's certainly up there, I would think, in Rockets history at the very least. Next up is number 13 on the big board, Terry and Arnold out of Alabama, 5'11", 189 pounds, a tier one prospect here as well. Coverage grade of 84.9 and 28 ball hawks in his career. Very, very good on both fronts there. Athleticism is his big calling card. He is a good enough athlete overall that he still put it up a 925 relative athletic score, even with a 4.5 in the 40 yard dash. Hardly an elite number for a cornerback. Did well enough in the agility drills uh, that he still, and the explosive drills, the, the jumping stuff, that he still put up an elite level relative athletic score. He does a lot of work in the slot too, or did for Alabama, 200 snaps in the slot last year. A bit of a rarity among the corners that I looked at that are primarily outside guys. That ability to jump inside at need is not something that comes up a lot. He doesn't profile well in man coverage though. Objective and subjective measures both point that out. People who, you know, just run the eye test say he doesn't do that well when he does, does man coverage. Pro Football Focus's numbers on his man coverage abilities are are not all that great. He's also not terribly experienced. He redshirted in 2021, then played the last two seasons, played a fairly substantial role for Alabama these last two years, uh, but just was not an immediate contributor. Alabama does things a little bit differently. Their talent pipeline has historically been so good that they don't have to throw guys out there right away. But you see, cornerbacks tend to be a bit of an exception to that rule, college football wide. You tend to play early if you're able to to play at all because so much of it is dependent on athleticism at the college level that you might as well be out there if you are an elite athlete. Uh, But, but Arnold was not out there. Um, That I think is, is at least worth mentioning, if not a point against him. He was actually recruited for a fun fact as a safety before ending up at corner at Alabama was a a highly regarded safety prospect, but uh, appeared to be better suited for corner during his time with Alabama. Next up is one of my most intriguing prospects, I think, in the NFL draft. Number 20 on the consensus mock draft big board, Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. Six foot, 173 pounds, weighed in a bit heavier at his pro day, but the concern, we'll just put this right at the front here, is just basically weight. That is very light. 173 pounds at six foot one is, is Trevor, Dave, Trevor Davis levels of skinny. Uh, that is not what you want for a guy with that amount of length. You want him to be a little bit heavier, and that does you know play against him in things like run defense and stuff like that. But he is a, a very, very good prospect, a Tier 1 prospect by our measures. Fantastic athlete, even among fantastic athletes at the position, 4.28 in the 40-yard dash, and backs it up with pretty solid numbers. 83.9 coverage grade his final year at Clemson, 27 ball hawks. He checks the boxes. Uh, we talked about the bad. The good stuff is that, again, he's a fantastic athlete, even among elite athletes. He does it all, zone and man, and grades out well in all of his responsibilities. The the knock on him is just going to be size. Could he play at a heavier weight? That remains a bit of an unknown, but he's almost certainly going to have to add some weight or his functional strength is just going to be low because he'll be going up against wide receivers who outweigh him by 30 pounds. That's going to be a problem. And, and 200 and say you weigh 203 pounds, he'd be heavier than his combine weight. They'd be heavier than his combine weight by 30 pounds. And that's not even that big for a receiver. It, the Packers have thrown out receivers. Think of Alan Lazard going up against a guy who's 173 pounds. You're giving up 50 pounds to a guy like Alan Lazard. He will outmuscle you just by the fact, like no matter how much effort and intensity you put into being a cornerback, there's just football is a game about big people. And if you're giving up 50 pounds to somebody, you are objectively not a very big person. And that's going to work against you at some degree. It just it basically has to. So how NFL teams weigh that, no pun intended, 
is going to be interesting as we, we watch this draft process and how he plays in the NFL. Fun fact, he's a sociology major and put that sociology major to good effect at Clemson by starting the Wigs Worldwide Foundation to, quote, improve the lives of young people by supporting underprivileged communities, end quote. Next up, we drop all the way down to number 71 on the big board with Max Melton out of Rutgers, 5'11", 187 pounds, Tier 1 prospect, but borderline, I would say. 73.7 coverage grade. We cast a wide net on this fairly intentionally just to, to make sure that we've got guys that we, we feel like we can talk about. But he does make it. Also made quite a few plays on the ball. 32 ball hawks, 8 interceptions, 22 passes defensed in his college career. Those are good numbers in those areas. The good on, on Melton is that basically he has a lot of good, but very little great in his scouting profile. 73.7 coverage grade is about as good as it gets for him graded out by pro football focus at a 74.6 in in man or in zone coverage his other numbers run defense man coverage um, overall defense even were not quite that good everything else is in the mid to low 60s which is fine enough but you'd hope for a little bit better from a guy that we're calling a an upper end product uh prospect it's kind of weird to to look at his profile and come away super excited. I, I have a hard time doing it because he's one of those guys that nothing is bad, but you just wish things were better. And that feels unfair to criticize him for. This is just where I'm at, that there are better and cleaner profiles uh, among the guys that we look at, even on guys that are lower on the consensus mock draft chart uh, than Melton is. But he seems like a solid enough corner who was, was solid enough in college It's not that anything was even particularly bad. You just wish things would be a little bit better. Fun fact here, you know that his brother is Bo Melton, but did you know his father, Gary, played wide receiver and running back at Rutgers from 1987 to 1991? And his mother, Vicky, competed on the Rutgers women's basketball team from 1989 to 1993. In addition to his brother, he has quite an athletic family. We go big with our next pro- next prospect, Cam Hart out of Notre Dame is number 88 on the consensus mock draft big board, 6 foot 3, 202 pounds. A coverage grade of 84.2 and 22 career ball hawks means that he is a tier 2 prospect. He barely missed, but he still missed just a little bit. He's got some very interesting size here, even despite the track record of tall corners not working out. Hello Kevin King, I can't help but be intrigued by that. It, it's a big person's game, and if he's a big person who's playing well at cornerback, that's hard to ignore. The bad is that his athleticism is good but not great, just an 8.88 relative athletic score, 4.5 in the 40-yard dash. Um, not inspiring numbers, but certainly not bad by any any extent. Uh, he was recruited, as a fun fact, as a receiver at Notre Dame and was a pretty good one in college or in high school, excuse me. According to the ESPN scouting service, he was the number 32 ranked receiver in the country uh, as a recruit, but ended up playing defense at Notre Dame. Jumping down to number 142 on the consensus mock draft big board, we find Renardo Green out of Florida State, a 5'11", 186-pound prospect, a Tier 2 guy who barely, and I mean just barely, misses out on being in our Tier 1 group. He has a career 86.4, not a career, a final year 86.4 coverage grade, and the threshold for career ball hawks is 25 he had 24 and a half in his career because he has half a sack in his career. That is all that kept him out of being in our tier one group. So if you're looking at a mid to late round option here, our numbers say that Green would be a pretty good one. He is elite in man coverage. Pro Football Focus had him as a, a 90 grade in man coverage. However, he does not profile particularly well in zone coverage. They created him out at just a 68.1. Also offers one of the worst run defense grades in the sample. And again, a a kind of just borderline athlete, 824 relative athletic score, 449 in the 40, so not an overwhelming number there. He only did one agility drill, the the short shuttle, and tested in the 50th percentile. Most of his good athleticism numbers comes from those explosiveness numbers, the, the jumping, vertical jump, broad jump. He did elite performances in both of those. But if you're looking at overall athleticism and saying, oh, he's he's in the eights, he must be at least fast, not particularly, wasn't good in the agility drills, but can jump out of the gym. That's really what is bolstering his number. So maybe look at that with a bit of a grain of salt. Fun fact, he competed at the opening in 2018, which is an elite nationwide seven-on-seven football competition. 
Uh, this is the first time I've ever heard of that, which is kind of interesting to me. I'm sure it's well known among among other people's, but this was something new for me to learn about. So maybe it's something new for you to learn about as well. The opening, check it out on their website. Finally, among our big time prospects here, we've got one uh, prospect number 146 on the consensus mock draft big board, Elijah Jones out of Boston College. Good height, uh, okay on the weight, six foot one, 185 pounds. Tier one prospect again as well. Coverage grade of 89.8, 46 ball hawk, second most in the sample behind Quinion Mitchell. 36 career passes defense, good numbers there. The good on Jones is that he's very solid in man coverage. He graded out about around the, the mid-90s or so, low 90s. Uh, he bumps inside a little bit too, which is, again, as I've mentioned, a bit of a rarity in this year's class, around 90 to 100 slot snaps each of the last three years. So can do it, just doesn't do it super regularly. Or, or put it this way, he has done it. Let's put it put it more in those terms than that he can do it. Whether or not he can is going to be an open question at the NFL level, as it is with all defensive back prospects. He doesn't profile particularly well in zone coverage, at least according to Pro Football Focus's numbers. Take that for whatever you will. Maybe they just don't have him do it all that often. But if you're looking for a guy who might be of interest to new Packers defensive coordinator Jeff Halfley, how about the guy who graded out really well in man coverage at the school where Jeff Halfley coached? I'm sure this insight isn't unique to me, but it seems like something we should keep an eye on. Fun fact, he scored a 99-yard touchdown as a wide receiver in high school, and I'm always going to think that 99-yard touchdowns are interesting no matter what level of football they take place. A few other guys that I'm going to be keeping an eye on, though they don't necessarily miss it, meet our thresholds in terms of um, just interesting, you know, wh- what we look for. Um, there's a few guys we just don't have testing numbers on again, and they may be testing here in the next couple of days. We'll try to update that as we can. Um, I know Kool-Aid McKinstry in particular um, was borderline on a couple of, of testing metrics, so worth keeping an eye on. He's not even on my list here, but uh, so I highly regarded cornerback. So um, just take testing numbers with a grain of salt. Most of what I do in terms of you know evaluating guys uh, using – Uh, relative athletic score as a filter is mostly just to get a manageable number of guys for me to look at. I mean, my notes for this episode, we didn't even talk about all that many guys at cornerback, but they're seven pages long. There's, there's only so much time that I have to look at it guys. Um, even just doing it the way that we do not, not grinding all that much tape at all, really. Um, but just remember that it's not the be all end all here. So we're just trying to get a manageable number of guys to look at and saying, these are the guys that might be noteworthy within that group of guys. Um, so if there's somebody that, you know, is a highly regarded prospect that we haven't talked about or, or just don't talk about, that's usually why, not because I don't think that they're a good player, but because we're trying to just get the draft class down to a manageable number of guys to talk about. Anyway, other interesting guys at cornerback, number 89 on the big board, Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon, just missed on the uh, the ball hawks metric, uh, that very much tongue-in-cheek, but just 12 in his career, but very solid coverage grade and a borderline athlete, borderline athlete at a 7-9 relative athletic score, nearly six foot four, about 194 pounds. Look, I would understand it if you are skeptical of taking another you know, long athletic cornerback from the Pacific Northwest, uh, but this guy seems to be an interesting prospect at the very least. Next up is Nehemiah Pritchett, number 176 on the big board out of Auburn, just missed on, rel- on athleticism, 783 relative athletic score, uh, dinged on the vertical, the broad jump, and the three cone. So take that for whatever you think it's worth. Um, if those numbers matter a lot to you, then that's a big deal. If they don't, well, maybe you think he's a better athlete than his testing numbers show up. He checked everything else, though. Um, worth watching. I wouldn't feel bad if they drafted him, had solid coverage numbers, made a bunch of plays on the ball in college. Um, I think if you're looking at, if he's 176, you're looking at you know a mid to late round pick there, unless he goes higher than expected, higher than the consensus right now. Uh, that you probably wouldn't feel too bad if they drafted him on day three, even if some with some subpar athleticism numbers. And again, not all that uh, subpar either. Finally, number 179, Marcellus Dial out of South Carolina, 715 relative athletic score, just terribly uh, bad performance on the agility drills. But again, check the other boxes. 33 career ball hawks up there on the, uh, the coverage grade stuff. Um, if you can overlook probably just some, some bad coaching, on the agility scores, uh, or just throw those out entirely. He's probably a better athlete than his numbers suggest, and he does everything else pretty well. 
uh, very much, I would say, along the line of a, of a Nehemiah Pritchett, uh, but for a few things that he maybe just wasn't very good at, uh, you'd be talking about him as a much better prospect even in the later rounds than than he's showing up so far. Uh, if you're looking for a special teamer with a little bit of you know plus value on the back end uh, as a depth defensive back, a guy like Dial or Pritchett probably isn't too bad of a prospect. Again, cornerback is a very tough one to evaluate. I think even professional evaluators struggle with cornerback because of all the reasons we talked about. There's a lot of projection that goes on with cornerback. This seems like a pretty good guess. It's the best, best, best guess that I've got. And, um, you know, if the Packers decide that they need some help at corner, these names I think would be particularly interesting. Elijah Jones just can't shake that idea of a Boston College guy uh, being of interest to the Packers, considering their very recent, very strong connection to that university. But, hey, connections aren't everything except for an NFL football when they're everything. So, We'll see what happens here in the NFL draft, getting very close now, just a couple of weeks away, and I'm excited for it, and I hope you're excited as well. That's all I've got for you on this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I would appreciate it even more if you'd take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, perhaps me most of all, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.